into the weather. It's oh. a bit chilly. Summery. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Beechgrove. Hello and welcome to this area that we call the Bargain Border. Now, Callum, I think everyone's going to like this because we created this last year, gathering herbaceous perennials from around the garden and it costs us absolutely nothing. Which is great, Carol. But, you know, there's loads of different ways, of course, dividing plants. You know, there's a the basic where we just go and split them or down here where our primulas, we've just teased away to get single plantlets. But over here, look at that iris. Stunning, isn't it? And all we did there was dug down, got some of the rhizomes and moved them from where it originally was into the bargain border. Yeah, absolutely tremendous. And, you know, you mentioned the iris. Varieties called deep black. I mean, I think it's absolutely stunning. Oh, it is. And what I like about it, how it starts purple and then goes to black. But down here, I'm picking out the hookera and the variety is chocolate ruffles. And just look at the red. I love the name because I love <laughs> chocolate. But, you know, what I'm amazed about is how quickly it's got established. Yeah. It really is filled in. And the thing is, OK, we have a large garden, but I think people at home could do this because if you've got friends, surely you could do a little bit of exchange of plants. Yeah, a bit of a swap. Well, later in the programme, we're going to be checking in with beach growers from Orkney to Dumfries. They'll be giving us an update for the last time we visited them. And speaking about gardens all around Scotland, we are looking at a garden that is literally on the move. And also, we're back with George in his allotment, and he's looking at some of his highs, but also one or two of his lows. On the allotment in sunny Joppa today, there are successes and failures. But which is which? I'd like to give you a bit of an update on one of our projects this year. It's all about trying to grow tomatoes in Aberdeen outside, and it'll be a first for us. Now, this all came about because of Camilla Fredrickson that we visited last year. She grows loads of varieties in Abalawa successfully outside, and this year she came to Beech Grove and gave us a few plants. And straight away, I want to look at this one. It's called 42 Days. And just to go over what that means, 42 two days it means that as soon as it flowers it should take 42 days for us then to get ripe fruit so only six weeks now these were planted in pots and they were only put outside three weeks ago but the great news is the fact that here we have a ripe fruit already so I'm just so delighted with that so from 42 days I then want to go on to this variety Ida gold it takes about 60 days and here we have one or two fruits that are starting to ripen but we might have to wait another week or two and fuzzy wuzzy love the name it's got hairy leaves that one is 70 days we've got some fruits but definitely not ripe yet and we're also trying some that are grown as cordons we've got a beefsteak one here called sputnik totally green at the moment but i always like to do a little bit of an observation or a trial and I thought, let's have a wee comparison with growing them outside and also undercover. So let's have a look at those ones. Now, straight away, I'm going to say this isn't a proper observation because if it was, we really should be growing these plants undercover in the same pots and the same compost. And as a result, in these beds, we've been growing tomatoes for about four years, and I do think they're a little bit stunted. It does just go to show that really you shouldn't be using the same soil for the same crop. However, the good news is straight away, look at the 42 days, we've got three ripe fruits there, so the heat has definitely helped. Also, I want to draw your attention to Sputnik, the beefsteak one. The outside was totally green, but that one is absolutely ripening. So it's working and we'll come back later on in the season. Now, from growing tomatoes, we're now going to give you an update on the Dandelion Project. Now, this is a public scheme that is throughout Scotland and throughout the summer. They are encouraging people to garden and they are creating some unexpected gardens. And this particular one is really unexpected. The Dandelion Project is a summer-long programme of events aimed at getting us all to grow, sow and share. A few weeks ago, we visited one of their unexpected gardens in Greenock. But there are gardens even more unexpected than that one. 
this particular unexpected garden is floating and we're just preparing it at the moment. It's getting ready to go down from here to Glasgow and then it's going to travel through the canal system. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful event because it, it kind of brings together all the elements of, of Dandelion. We've been planning this for, for ages and it's like a sort of poetic idea, the idea of, of travelling from the west of Scotland to the east of Scotland distributing plug plants. And so now, after months and months of preparation, we're finally ready. Today the Dandelion team are docked at Coast Scythe on the Forth and Clyde Canal, preparing the floating gardens ahead of the start of their Glasgow to Edinburgh tour. So I'm essentially in charge of getting these uh, Scotch Canals boats from Glasgow to Edinburgh um, safely and also along the way to distribute all of these plants to people who want to uh, have their first shot at growing their own. This is kind of very much a kind of demonstration kind of vessel to get people interested. It might even get people interested in the idea of having their own allotment, that kind of thing. So this is just to kind of show what can be done, give a bit of inspiration and then we send people home with their own herb plants to grow at home. We're stopping in 10 locations between Glasgow and Edinburgh and each one we're going to be giving a selection of kind of easy to grow windowsill herbs for people to grow. And these are the kind of easy, quick, kind of hopefully successful wins that gets people hooked on growing their own. So we've got some chives, some parsley and some basil uh, that people are growing. They'll also be getting their own coriander seeds to be able to uh, try growing from seed for the first time as well. Before it was a garden, this barge was used to gather rubbish from the canal and clean-up work is being carried on by another of the vessels in the Dandelion Floating Garden Fleet. These are native wetland plants, drawing nitrogen and phosphorus directly from the canal, helping create a healthy balance in the water. This is the canal water right here, right here. We're just a few centimetres below the surface and the roots are submerged and they're taking in the nutrients and Biotar here is uh, locking the nutrients in. Preparations are almost complete. It's time to cast off for the first event. It's the 20th of June, and it's launch day for the unexpected floating garden. The first event is on Spears Wharf in the centre of Glasgow. From here, the boats will travel to Edinburgh. Whenever the dandelion barges flow into dock and give away their plants, they are accompanied by the water goddess singing out across the water and the garden. What we hope they're going to take away is just how important it is to understand their food, to understand where their food comes from and the possibility that they can grow their own food and share it with their friends, with their neighbours, with their families. It's, it's awesome to finally see the floating gardens making their way along the canals and their ten stops between Glasgow and Edinburgh. From here we've got the sun shining, we've got the wind behind us and we're just hopefully steady sailing to Edinburgh. And on its way, it will spread the message of sustainability and the value of grown. Something the youngsters at the first event are already aware of. Well, I was just really, like, very proud to be part of this because it's a big thing to all people in Scotland because we're um, trying to stop climate change. So I think it's really good. Plant anything anywhere, mostly. And that it doesn't matter if it's in grass or water, you can plant it and help the world. The floating gardens is a great idea for the environment. Go and see if they can create something better for the environment and more sustainable. But we've been doing a lot in our school garden as well to try and make sure that we grow things and that we can actually be doing something in our school. The floating garden is on a journey to encourage more to grow, sow and share. After its journey, it will moor at the Kelpies in Falkirk until September. And if you're into gardening, it's sure to float your boat. Well, I'm back on dry land here at Beach Grove in my own garden. And remember, the theme for up here is it's going to be a young person's garden, want to work on a budget, and I'm trying to recycle as much as possible. And speaking of recycling, we took these bricks for the old garden and we've kept them to use as a bit of an edge. And all it is is a case of building up with the cement and then putting the bricks on top. And now I'm just giving it a nice edge to give it a nice finish. But a lot's happened since you were last here. I mean, just look at the place. I'm pleased with how it's going on. We've got all the edging in, and this side is eventually going to look like this side. We're going to have the stones down with a nice bench and my pots. 
and I'm happy to say on this side that all the landscaping is finished up here, so the fun area is done, apart from the bar. Gonna add that in, but that's coming soon. Today's job is working on my pots with a bit of seasonal colour. So what a lot of people like to do is put the taller plants in the centre of the pot. But what I'm going to do is put the bigger plants at the back. So I've got some cosmos here. And that's going to give us plenty of height and colour. Just take these out. Tease the roots a bit. And I'm going to put two plants at the back. Just two plants at the back. There we go. And then in front of that, I'm going to have some nice orange marigolds and let's do two of them as well that's going to be the centre and at the side of them we're going to have some simple Florence begonias let's also do two and then to give me a bit of, a bit of trailing down the front I've got this Nepita and then just knock that out the pot and I'm glad this is on the deck because it's just going to trail down and then scramble all over the background, so it's going to look really nice. But I've got quite a lot still to do here, but let's go check up with George with his next instalment in Sunny Joppa and his allotment where, like us all, he's battling the weeds. Hello and welcome to my allotment in Sunny Joppa. Now, those of you who were with me a fortnight ago when I planted these dahlia tubers in here will remember that this was a clean piece of land. Well, look at the germination of weeds that are in here. And I have to say that the majority of these weeds are nettles. And if you zoom in close, you will see the little nettle leaves that are there. It's a right little pest. Once I've hoed them out, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take you over there, we're going to have a look at some garlic. Now, that's not my most successful crop, but we'll see how it's done this year. This is where I have to make a confession, and the confession is that my allotment is absolutely rife with white onion rot. So, when I grow onions, I've got to be very careful. When I grow garlic, I've got to be very careful. And people might think, well, that looks awfully dead, George, but that's the end of the season. The stuff is now dying back. So it's time to lift it. So if I just lift this like that, I mean, that's not bad. It, it, this is elephant garlic, so it's related to, related to the leek. And that's, that will dry and that should be okay. This one here, I don't know about, we'll see. That's not any good. I can tell already because it's wet, so it's full of full of fungus, and I'll, have, I'll show you that in a minute. This one, that's not too bad. That will dry off, and we can use that. There we are. This one here, it's the same. Now it's really, really disappointing. Look at look at that there. See that? That's the fungus, and that gets into these uh, leeks and onions and garlic, and it just causes huge problems. So I've really got to come up with another strategy for growing this stuff. If I want to grow it, it's either don't grow it or come and think about some other way of doing it. <laughs> I've come down to where the plot of early potatoes are. This was a group of potatoes that were planted way back in March and covered with the black fabric. Uh, and then once the frost was away, lifted the fabric off. This is the variety Casablanca, and normally when you have early potatoes and you see them with the flowers on them like that, it's an indication, an indication, that there may be tubers at the base. So I'm going to dig a shaw up and see if there's better success here than there was with the garlic. Keeping it well free from where the potatoes are, but loosening it off. So, here we go. Moment of discovery. A wee shake. There we are. Oh, ho, ho, look at this. Look at this. Now, that's success, eh? That's success. Look at those early potatoes. And all they need now? <laughs> some butter, salt and some mint. And oh, they'll be enjoyed at tea time. There we go. Now, traditionally, what would happen in East Lothian and, and in allotments everywhere is that once you've lifted your early potatoes, 
the vacant space then is filled with leeks. And this is the variety elephant. And it's one which I think I'll put in here once I've lifted all these potatoes. I can't eat them all at once, so it'll take me about a fortnight, I think, to, to eat all those. And then we'll plant these leeks and that will be ready for the winter crops. Look at that. There you are. One of two tattered leaves, nonetheless. That's a good cabbage. What more do you want, eh? With new potatoes, mint, butter, and now cabbage. Oh, what do you want next? Would you like some peas? We'll go and see. Often when you see people picking peas, um, you see them with a pair of scissors. And that's fair enough. But what I do is, you know, you go along the row, find the, the, uh, the best pea pods like that, nice and, nice and juicy, one hand at the top, the other one underneath, and just pull it. And it snaps off just at the top. And you go all the way along and, and that's it. Then that leaves the young pods at the top with all the moisture that the roots are absorbing and they will fill up within a week. So you get two pickings very quickly, one after the other. And then when you're opening them, just press it on the bottom. There you go, look at that. Aren't these lovely? Super little peas. They are not going to waste. Mm. Oh. Caviar. Oh, lovely. George enjoying the fruits of his labour there, Carol. Well, certainly the peas, <laughs> but we're back in our usual spot, the calendar border, which we're revamping this year. But what's this? It's amazing, isn't it? It's absolutely looking gorgeous at the moment. So it's a cornus cusa. Right. A variety is called Galilean. And, you know, when you look at this, people will probably think that is the flower, but the flower is in the centre, really insignificant. Oh. Technical name is a bract. And the way to think of it is, think about your poncettias at uh -huh. Christmas time. Yes. The red that looks like a leaf, that's a bract as well. Oh, I see. But everything's just flourishing beautifully in the garden this year. And I think that's down to us not having such a harsh winter. Oh, you're absolutely right. And, and not late frost and things yeah. like that. But this dirt's here, again, absolutely laden with bloom. And the variety is called Montrose. Very Do you nice. think the branches are see, pulled over with blooms? <laughs> they are, yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's get on with the job at the end of the border. Yeah, something that we identified right at the start of the series, Carol, was that this lilac was needing pruned back, but we wanted to wait till it had flowered and then prune it. So important because once it's finished flowering, if you do the pruning then, we've got the rest of the season for it to put on new growth, and it's very often the new growth that holds the flowers yes. for next year. So straight away, I think we said about a lot of this foliage encroaching on the path, so we've yep. got to cut that out. And then down here, what I, I want to take that branch right back to the base, just so it can let the light into the ground. Good idea. And then I think, for example, look, this is some of the older wood with the lichen yep. on it. Nothing wrong with the lichen. It means we've got lovely fresh hair here. But I think we'll prune out some of that. So shall we get cracking? Yep. Now, when you're pruning, remember the three Ds. That's the dead, diseased, and dying. So this is definitely dead. Can't see anything diseased. But here, we're starting to see a bit that's dying back, so I'll follow it through. There's a nice, healthy bit. Just cut it there. You know, Carol, see, because I've cut that lower branch away, it's actually revealed a sucker. Oh, yes, so that's true. I'm going to have true. to go and take that out. I can tell that it's a sucker just because if you look at the leaves, this, the sucker one's rougher and the main plant's smoother. So I want to take this out till all the energy goes back into the main lilac. Now, something else to bear in mind is these are the old flowering spikes, and it's a good idea to try and prune those out because you don't want the energy going into those. You want it to go into the plant itself. And I think I've got two here, so a little bit of a light prune. I'm going to go back to this healthy branch, like so. Oh, no, not that branch. <laughs> I don't say that. You have to be worried there. <laughs> cool. Well, Callum, I think we're just about finished having yes. a sort of look round. And I think, you know, step back, isn't it? That's quite yeah. important. Do you see anything that we should maybe cut out now? I'm tempted with this branch here, Carol. I think that's a really good point. So, look, if we follow that down, I reckon if you cut it to there... Yeah, OK. I'll get, go at that. get the loppers. And you know what that'll do is it will reveal the liliums a bit more. 
Are they? Yes. But it's great, isn't it? And hopefully we'll get lots of lilac flowers for Hope next so. year. <laughs> So throughout the series, we're following a group of gardeners from Dumfries to Orkney. Yes, it's the beach growers again in their gardens and allotments. So let's start with a good news story. Here we are in the Hosta corner of the garden. It's lush, it's green, and it's full of growth. You might remember at the start of the series, I was mulching over the crowns of the hostas before they were through the ground, just to provide them with that wee boost to get them through. And look at them now, green leaves everywhere. And thankfully, not much slug damage, which is unusual for hostas because slugs love them. That's the good news story. Unfortunately, if we go down to the rose bed, we have a slight different problem and it's a green fly infestation. So in order to control the large number of green fly, I've been going around um, regularly, shaking the plant basically to shake off the green fly that you can see. I've also been pulling them off as well and rubbing them with my fingers. If that doesn't work because of the numbers, you can get the hose, blast them off. As soon as they're on the ground, they're very unlikely to be able to climb back up the stem and up to the good growth at the top of the plant. However, even that said, the number of green fly in here, as I said, has been huge. So I've had to use a solution, which is basically washing up soap, water, and some cayenne pepper sprayed over the plant. And that seems to be able to have controlled the numbers sufficiently. Today we're going to be doing a bit of an experiment with courgettes. Um, now, at the Stromness Community Garden we share excess plants with other members, that's how I got this courgette. And normally I'd be planting it in the polytunnel, but I thought I'd go on a little bit of an adventure when it comes to planting, so I'm going to be planting it outside this year. Because the rocks are the dominating feature of my soil, um, I am going to be using a uh, raised bed. Uh, this is a repurposed stoat trap that has been donated to the Stromness Community Garden and I am going to be putting some rocks in it because we have a lot of wind up here in Orkney so I need some rocks to keep it from blowing away because it's not that big. Now I'm putting it in. Um, I haven't put the soil right up to the top so that the trap itself also gives a bit of shelter to the plant and um, hopefully that will also help it along a little bit in uh, this environment. Now all I can do now is put it in its sheltered spot and keep my fingers crossed for um, courgettes this year. This week we're in the mini allotment and we're going to do some propagating. So we're going to get busy in the garden and look for strawberry runners. So let's go round to the mini allotment. So once you have got your soil potted up, you can then get your runner and always make sure that the runner is facing with the leaf up. This one doesn't have roots on it yet. And then you just gently place it, a little clip on it, and then you can leave it beside the mother plant. It's now where it can root for one to two weeks, and then you can snip it off and take this plant, and it'll be a whole new strawberry plant. Hi, beach growers. This is Sarah. Hello, I'm Rebidi. Hello, I'm Damo. Hi, I'm Kazim. We are going to build a, a grow station today. Let's see how we are going to build it and how we are going to use the growth station. Uh, we can, uh, you know, plant things like potatoes, uh, tomatoes, carrots, beetroots. Let's let's find a place to put this, boys. Yeah. Welcome back to the Wimpy Park here in Aloha. Today we are in the wild flower area. In early spring we saw thousands of white flower seeds, but only some of them managed to grow. Our problem is too much grass, so late last autumn.
is so yellow rattle seats. Yellow rattle is a great pollinator and bees love them. It's also a parasite that takes the nutrition from the grass roots and hinders the growth and kills the grass, thus clearing an area for a wildflower meadow. We will be sowing more yellow rattle seeds later in the autumn to combat our problem. This is my favourite area of the park. I love the colours, I love watching the bees, the butterflies, the moths, the hoverflies, etc. This area has some frogs and toads. It's a mini safari park. Welcome back to Dumfries where today we're talking about basil and tomato. No, it's not the start of a great recipe, but it is the start of a great edible companion plant. So companion planting to get rid of aphids, is it science or is it a myth? Well, here I've got six tomato plants and I've got two basils growing in between them, no aphids. I've then got a further four tomato plants with calendula in between it, no aphids. Then I come to two tomato plants at the top, no companion planting, but it's full of aphids. So to try and overcome the aphids on these plants, what I'm going to do is plant some of the sturgeons that I had in a hanging basket. These apparently repel the aphids. Gorgeous flowers attract the predators, hoverflies and ladybirds, and they get a free meal off your plants. Not only that, you can eat the leaves because they're edible. Then add the calendula flower to your salad, along with basil. Callum, this is your first time sitting in the silver garden. Yeah, and it's very nice down this end of the garden, Carol. But I've got to pick out the napeet over here. The bees are just loving life. But then over this side, is this where we've got the iris from for the bargain border? Absolutely. And you know, the plant next to that, uh -huh. I really love because it's a very hardy plant. Yeah. Uh, Sambucus, black lace or an elder. And I just love the contrast of that foliage with the flowers. But you know, that's just about it for this week. But if you need any help with your hebes or tips on your tomatoes, do remember that the whole of the series can be found on the iPlayer. And all you have to do is search for Beech Grove. And next week, George is here. Yep, he's leaving Sonny Joppa to join me and Glorious Aberdeen. He's going to be answering some of your questions and I'm going to be putting him a work around the garden. <laughs> and you know, I'm really excited because I'm getting a trip out. Oh. I'm going to Doonside Garden near a boy. Very nice. But that's it from the two of us. So goodbye. Bye. Things are hotting up in the kitchen as Nick and Doogie rustle up some tasty Asian fusion food. The great food guys are next here on BBC Scotland. Mm -hmm.